Good evening and welcome to the Ford Hall Forum. My name is Sandy Bacalar and I'm a member of the Ford Hall Forum Board of Directors. Tonight, with the assistance of our distinguished guests, we will examine ethnic violence in the world today and try to gain perspective on such tragedies by looking back at the Holocaust. As many of you may know, tonight's program is co-sponsored by the New England Holocaust Memorial Committee and commemorates the groundbreaking of the memorial later this month. Before we begin, I would like to take just a moment to tell you how excited the forum is that we are able to coordinate tonight's program with the New England Holocaust Memorial Committee. We are proud we can offer you this opportunity to participate in a discussion of one of the most disturbing issues of our time. Public education and discussion not only help us to understand the events happening in our world, but also compel us to recognize and address issues often swept under the global carpet. Since our inception in 1908, the forum has been dedicated to providing free public education to the greater Boston community. And we hope to continue to provide an arena in which to discuss the important news of the day. But we can only do this with your support. The forum membership table is located by the entrance of the building, and I urge you to visit that table find out about the other great programs we are offering this spring and make as large a contribution as you can. We would really appreciate it. The next Ford Hall Forum program will be held here at Old South Meeting House a week from today on Thursday, April 15th. We will present well-known media personalities Marjorie Claprood and Judy Jarvis who will discuss the new role of talk radio in American politics. I'm excited to inform you that tonight's program, as well as several other forums this season, will be broadcast over WBUR on Monday evenings at 8 p.m. We will also be telecasting our entire season over Boston Neighborhood Network later this spring. And now on to tonight's program. Robert F. Drynan is best known locally as the former representative of the 4th District of Massachusetts in the U.S. House. He served in Congress from 1971 until 1983. He has taught at several law schools and is currently a professor at Georgetown University Law Center, where he specializes in, among other areas, international human rights. Long recognized for his commitment to civil liberties worldwide, Father Drynan has actively participated in many associations, including, and this is a short list, Lawyers uh, Committee for International Human Rights, Bread for the World, and U.S. Holocaust Memorial Commission. And I am now pleased to prese present Father Robert F. Drynan, who will introduce the rest of tonight's panelists. Father Drynan. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bacala. Whenever I return to my native city of Boston, this city that I love so much, I always recall the words of President Kennedy. He came here in 1963 to speak at the centennial of Boston College, and before 30,000 people in the outdoor forum, he electrified us and amused us by opening with these lovely words. President Kennedy said that, I always like to come back to Boston where people pronounce words like they're spelt. <laughs> <clears throat> My dear friends, we come together at a time between Passover and Good Friday to remember our roots and to recall our traditions as the children of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We express our gratitude tonight in a special way to the Ford Hall Forum. For 85 years, they have been doing things like this, bringing us together, not allowing us to forget our roots and our faith and our common humanity. And as we think of the topic tonight, we have to recall what happened just a year ago. Two days ago, we recalled with horror the first anniversary of the genocide in Bosnia. And this week, we recall the 25th anniversary of the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King. And we keep asking ourselves, how, why could these slaughters go on? Did we not acquire enough guilt when Cain killed Abel 
Have we not learned uh, enough guilt from the Holocaust when six, thousand, six million Jews were murdered? Elie Wiesel, as you know, has said it well. Those who are silent continue the work of the executioner. And Dante spoke about those who do not resist evil. And he said, for those who are silent in the presence of injustice, there is a special place in hell. And both the Old and the New Testament make it very clear that those who do not portray or protest injustice betray the commands of God and man. But my dear friends, we should remember that many lovely things are happening and people do remember. As was announced on April 18th at Faneuil Hall, there will be a service to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Warsaw uh, Ghetto Uprising. That happened in 1943 on the first night of the Passover. And on that very day, the magnificent Holocaust Memorial will be uh, started here in Boston. And also later in this month, I expect to attend the opening of the Holocaust Memorial uh, in Washington, where, as you know, this magnificent building is about to be opened on the Mall, where millions will see it every single year. I cannot commend the local Holocaust Memorial enough, and I commend Steve Dickerman, the executive director of this Holocaust Memorial, and you will see very soon this monument along Freedom Trail with six glass towers, each of which will have the eternal burning flame. I also commend the work of Facing History and Ourselves. That uh, work is ever more important. And I think also that we should remember, even though we may be uh, frightened tonight, we should remember that 111 nations did agree to rescind that awful UN resolution in 1975, condemning Zionism as a form of racism. The level of Christian-Jewish dialogue and collaboration is at the highest level now, I'm pleased to say, that uh, it has been for a century. Let me just be personal before I introduce the distinguished guests. In the recent past, I went through Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, and one is overcome with the thousands of persons that are named there, and I somehow couldn't really speak after I saw room after room of people whose name was Rosenthal. And when I came out, no one wants to talk. It is so horrifying and terrifying and appalling. And that I remember that at that moment, I understood almost for the first time what Elie Wiesel has said many times, that for about 10 years after the Holocaust, in which he was a victim, he couldn't even mention it. He couldn't write about it at all. I'm happy to, to present to you the distinguished people who will enlighten us tonight in the order of their appearance, and they'll be talking for eight or 12 minutes, more or less. And then, as you know, there is an open dialogue after that. We want your questions. I say now, before I forget, that you should, if at all possible, direct them to one of the panelists. Make your question or your comment very succinct, because we want to hear from as many people as possible. Israel Arbeiter is a survivor of the six Nazi concentration camps and a Nazi ghetto. After being liberated by the American troops in April 1945 and four years of living in a displaced persons camp in uh, Germany, Mr. Arbeiter came to the United States. Mr. Arbeiter is co-founder and president of the American Association of Holocaust Survivors of Greater Boston, as well as one of the founders of the New England Holocaust Memorial Committee. May I ask you to withhold your applause until all four have been presented. We are pleased to have Ambassador Mohammed Shakrabi, who, was, who is the permanent representative and ambassador to the United Nations for the Republika, Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. He was appointed last year to that position. Prior to his appointment, the ambassador held several positions in finance uh, companies, including senior vice president of the S Security Pacific Merchant Bank, vice president of Standard Poor's Corporation, he was born in Sarajevo. He came to this country and has his AB and his LLM, his law degree, from Tulane, and his MBA from Columbia University. We are also pleased to have here Kanan Makia. He published in 1989 the volume Republic of Fear, a portrait of Ba'athist terror in Iraq. His subsequent work includes the exposure of the 1988 campaign of mass murder against the Kurdish people in northern Iraq, and his most recent book, Cruelty and Silence, 
confronts the rhetoric of Arab and pro-Arab intellectuals with the realities of political cruelty in the Middle East. We are happy also to have Mr. Kanyan Makia. He was born in Baghdad. He left uh, Baghdad to study architect architecture in uh, MIT, and that he joined his father to design many of the major projects throughout the Middle East. In 1989, he published The Republic of Fear, and that that uh, volume, I'm happy to say, has now sold 150,000 copies worldwide. Our distinguished guest then wrote The Monument, an essay on the aesthetics of power in Saddam's Iraq. And in 1992, he acted as the convener of the Human Rights Committee of the Iraq Iraqi National Congress. His latest book, Cruelty and Silence, will be published by Norton Publishers on April 1. Finally, we have uh, a distinguished lady, well known to you, Dr. Helen Fine, has served as the executive director of the Institute for the Study of Genocide. She has her PhD from Columbia University, and she is currently a visiting fellow at the Human Rights Program at Harvard Law School. Dr. Fine is the author and editor of several books and monographs concerned with genocide, collective violence, and anti-Semitism, including her most recent book, Teaching About Genocide. Please show your appreciation by a hand to all of these four panelists. Uh, Mr. Israel Arbaita. <clears throat> thank you very much, Father Drinan, and thank you to the Fourth Hall Forum for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Association of Jewish Holocaust Survivors. In the month of April, we Jews have two important events on the calendar. Right now, we are in the midst of, a, of celebrating the holiday Passover, which teaches us about the flight of the Jewish people, the Israelites, their freedom from bondage, their freedom from slavery, and being led by Moses to the Promised Land. Next week, we will be observing in various schools, organizations, churches, synagogues, and the large gathering here in Boston and Faneuil Hall. We will be observing the biggest tragedy, the history of the biggest tragedy that has ever befallen the Jewish people, meaning the Shoah, the Holocaust. In 1939, when World War II broke out, I was 14 years old. I come from a city called Plotsk in Poland, 120 kilometers northeast of Warsaw, or 90 kilometers from the German border. Being close to the East Prussian border, it took the German army three days to occupy the city of Plotsk. After another three or four days, as the frontline troops were marching on and the occupation troops were coming in, meaning the SS, the SR, and other battalions, with them came the Nuremberg Laws. The Nuremberg Laws, which were enacted, enacted in Germany in 1935, were now brought upon us. Meaning that first we were ordered to wear a yellow star with the name, with the reading, uh, Jude, Jew. In some places, we were forced to wear white and blue armband with the Star of David on it. Jewish businesses were being confiscated. Education was stopped, schools were closed. Jews were forced to 
turn in their belongings, their valuables, and we were forced to work slave labor. Not long after that, a ghetto was imposed. A ghetto in Poland was not the kind of a ghetto that we hear over here in this country. With all due respect to all the minorities who live in segregated, area, in segregated areas. A ghetto in Poland meant the Jewish population was restricted to a certain area, enclosed either by wire fence or by a brick wall so that nobody could leave without a permit. A permit was given only to those who performed work for the uh, German government, for the German army. Any Jew being caught outside the ghetto without a permit under the law could have been shot on the spot, and many were. Food were rationed, and only those were getting uh, ration cards that were going out to work. Those that did not work didn't have to eat, and so they did not get any rations. But with all the restrictions and with all the bad things that were happening in the ghettos, people were dying, starvation, sickness, being beaten, shootings by the Germans, we would have survived. We would have lived. Some people died, many people died, but we would have survived. But the Germans had other plans for us. And 1941, the city of Plotsk was incorporated into the, into the Third Reich and declared Judenrein or free of Jews. And we were forced to leave the city and leave everything behind. My family, consisting of my parents and five brothers, were forced to leave. We were sent out from there into central Poland to a place called Starachowice and incarcerated into a slave labor camp. We were working there under severe conditions, under unbearable conditions. Again, uh, food rationing, very strict food rationing, beating. Uh, uh, the ghetto there, the, the life was very unbearable. For instance, uh, you must know that in, in Europe at that time, especially in Poland, the living conditions were not the same what they are here in the United States. Uh, there were very few houses that had running water or had uh, toilets, forgive me. Families, large families, were living in, in one, two rooms. When the Germans formed the ghetto and started to bring in people from nearby villages and towns, so now where a family, for instance, of five or seven people had two rooms, they were forced to take in another one or two families in the same uh, two rooms. So instead of five or seven, you had now between 10 and 15 people living in the same rooms. But again, we would have survived. Not all of us, some would have perished, but we would have survived. But the Nazis were not happy with that either. They had other plans for us, Jews. And so in 1941, A group of SS officers and members of the German government were ordered into a village outside Berlin called Wannsee with the orders by Heinrich to work out a plan for the final solution of the Jewish problem. Now, mind you, let's stop here for a minute. A few, if you allow me, drunken assessment were giving the authority to work out a plan for the final solution of a people, 
of a nation, of an ethnic group, of millions of people. And they did. They came out with a plan of how to destroy the, the Jewish people. The order was that all the Jews living now in the occupied territories, that means German occupied ter territories, and those that will be occupied in the future or will fall into the hands of the German due to the cause of the war, shall be exterminated. Men, women, children, camps, special death camps were built, six death camps. Treblinka, Birkenau, Belzec, Majdanek, Sobibor. Now, for the first time in the history of the world, factories for the destruction of human beings were built and in process and were working. The German people accepted that and were silent. The world accepted that and were silent. In October of 1942, after I selection on the marketplace, my mother, my father, my youngest brother that was seven years old at the time, that did not know anything about politics, that was not involved in any way in the war, and they did not do all those bad things that the Germans were telling the world that the Jews are doing, were taken to Treblinka, never to be seen again. I and two of my brothers, after working slave labor in the camp of Starachowice, were sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau, to be exterminated there. The only thing was in Birkenau, where in some of those camps, like uh, Treblinka, all the transports that were arriving were automatically led into the gas chambers and exterminated. In Birkenau, due to having factories around, ammunition factories around the camp, which the uh, uh, German industry built like uh, Krupp and IG Farben and so forth. There were selections in the camp conducted by Dr. Mengele's on the arrival of the transport. And they were taking out the young, the healthy, those that could work the slave labor. Young and old were led directly to the guest chambers, again, never to be seen again except the piles outside the crematoriums and the guest chambers of their clothing, their personal belongings, their shoes, glasses, and anything of that kind. If I were to stop here and tell you the fate or the life one day in Birkenau, I would have to take up the rest of the panel's time. It is just impossible to believe what life was in Birkenau for those that were sent in to live there. When I came into Auschwitz-Birkenau, outside the, the gate was a large sign which said, Arbeit macht frei. Freedom through work. But coming inside the camp, the world was, and you were told, the only way out from here is through the chimneys, meaning being killed and coming out through the, uh, through the chimney with the smoke. How did we survive? How come I'm here? I don't know. I'm being asked that question a lot. I could not answer. But I can say this. Thanks to the unmarching, fast-moving Allied armies in 1945, after coming out from Auschwitz, 
We, they had to evacuate us as fast because the Russian army was closing in there. We were on the dead march ordered by Himmle that all no prisoners should fall in the Allied hands. And we were led on a dead march, so called the dead march, into South Tyrolia, there to be put in the old mines, and the mines were to be destroyed with all the prisoners. Lucky, fortunate, thank God, we were liberated by the Allied armies. And after living uh, from 45 to 49 in the DP camps in Germany, I was allowed under the Truman Act in 1949 to come to this country with my wife and a six-month-old daughter. We have now, thank God, we have two daughters and a son and three grandsons. As a matter of fact, we have a great big celebration uh, on the 24th. Our, our newest grandson is going to be one year old. And so we have a great celebration there. I, I have to bring this in, in, in the sad part. Uh, I came then to Boston, and with other survivors, being busy, making a living, and organizing the families, we formed our, an organization of Holocaust survivors, which is still in existence, and we're participating in the community in various activities and helping and helped our survivors when they came over. Last year, or is it now two or three years ago, I don't remember exactly, I was asked and invited to be part of a committee that has in mind to build a memorial here in Boston in memory of the Holocaust. I accepted it. I thought it's a wonderful idea. And I am very happy that I am on that committee. And I am very happy to see the people and the, that are on the, on the various committees and the great work that is being done. I hope and I look forward for this to become a reality. And pretty soon, we might have a memorial erected here in Boston to the Holocaust. What did we learn from the Holocaust? Did we learn anything? Six million Jews perished. Millions of other people. Did we learn anything from it? We thought 1945, when the gates of the uh, concentration camps are, were open, the Allied armies marched in. Seeing what happened there, the thousands and thousands of skeletons, that the world have learned something about humanity and that this should never happen again. My dear friends, it is very painful. It is very painful for us survivors today to watch television and to see what's going on in other parts of the world, to see what's going on today in the former Yugoslavia, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. When we see the wire, the people, the hungry, the skeletons behind the wires, it is very painful to us. It reminds us of the times that we were there. And we hope and ask the world to take action and to stop this present Holocaust. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Arbeiter, the ambassador from Bosnia. Thank you very much, Father. Sometimes I'm not sure whether to address you congressman or father, but I'll go with father this time. It's, uh, I think, a more uh, noble profession. <laughs> and thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, Israel, when you were speaking about, when you started your speech about the history of the Holocaust, you said that this was one of the greatest tragedies and uh, I have no doubt it was the greatest tragedy of mankind. Um, I will not try to um, give it any greater weight because only a survivor such as yourself who has been through it, who has seen family murdered, can give it the appropriate weight. But the reason I emphasize it's the greatest tragedy 
is because sometimes when we see tragedies that are similar to it, they have characteristics of that tragedy, we tend to try to compare it to this biggest of all tragedies. And somehow if it doesn't measure up, we assume that, well, we don't have to respond. I remind all of you that when this tragedy, when the Holocaust was happening 50 some years ago, people still <coughs> failed to respond. And therefore I think all that's happening is rationalization. That somehow if we are not moved, we believe that we can say, well, that's not as bad as the Holocaust. Only a quarter million people have died, not the six million Jews and the millions of others. And therefore, it just isn't as bad. Well, I can tell you that to their credit, the Jewish community in the United States has been one of the most outspoken, if not the most outspoken, against this new genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it said something when this community that has suffered the most 50 years ago now takes upon itself to speak the loudest and frankly speak the loudest on behalf of a people many of whom are Muslims where there was assumed to be a big bridge, a big gap between Muslims and Jews. I think the term never again all of a sudden has been given universal meaning. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that others have accepted that term. Within the context of this issue, I think I'd just like to highlight a point, and I'll be happy to answer some questions. I know we're going to be running a little bit tight on time. There's a tendency now to define the situation in Boston and Herzegovina as a civil war. There is a tendency to somehow define the genocide that's going on there as a tribal warfare of uncivilized people. Well, first, this is not a civil war. Bosnia and Herzegovina is a country. Yes, at one time it was part of Yugoslavia, but now it is being aggressed on by another republic that was previously a part of Yugoslavia. If we, in fact, use this definition of civil war, then almost every war that's occurred in the past has been a civil war. The war against the Jews was a civil war. Second, the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina had developed long time ago a multicultural tradition. Not always perfect, but actually within the context of the last six, seven hundred years of history, maybe one of the best, if not the best in the world. In the 13th and 14th and 15th century, Islam, Catholicism, and Orthodox Christianity developed side by side. In 1492, thousands of Jews migrated to Bosnia because they perceived it as a place of tolerance, escaping the Spanish Inquisition. For the next few hundred years, Bosnia and Herzegovina was a place where church, mosques, and synagogues were built next to each other. Oh yes, it had its periods. It had its wars. It had its holocaust. But those were the exceptions, the exceptions brought about by fascists looking, looking to use ultranationalism to promote their own goals. What we have now in Bosnia-Herzegovina is a former, really an existing communist regime. It's the same leaders as in the old communist Yugoslavia, the same military, the same bureaucracy. They, say, they saw the death of communism, the fact that it is becoming discredited, and moved to apply, to adopt a new philosophy, to allow them to maintain their absolute power, authority, and privileges. And they perceived this vehicle to be ultranationalism. Then they unleashed this terrible weapon upon the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, yes, Bosnia, the war there has many elements of a civil war. But I remind you that the war in Bosnia did not start up with the break of Yugoslavia. It started first after a war was waged against Slovenia, 
then after a war was waged against Croatia, and then finally, after those two wars were settled, did the war against Bosnia and Herzegovina begin to be waged when the entire Yugoslav army from Croatia, in fact, had moved into Bosnia. Sometimes people like to compare Milosevic, leader of present-day Serbia, to Hitler. Many of the characteristics are there, similarities are there. But more importantly, I think, from a historical perspective, Milosevic is more like Mussolini. If you remember, Mussolini came to power almost a dozen years before Hitler did. He made the transition from communism to ultranationalism. And now he has obviously set out upon a course of fascism as Mussolini did. But where is the new Hitler? I'm afraid the new Hitler is waiting to be born in Russia. If you look at the similarities between today's Russia and the Germany between the two world wars. It's frightening. Russia is a defeated country. It has lost the war. Germany was a defeated country. Economy is in shambles. Inflation, hyperinflation, no tradition of democracy, militarism, intolerance and ultranationalism, numerous Russian minorities living in neighboring republics. Remember, Germany started its war of aggressions by saying that it was looking to unite all Germans under one roof, under one nation. That's what Serbia is doing now. That's what Russian far-right leaders are waiting to do. And we already know what these people are. They have already shown their symbols their writings of anti-Semitism. They have already shown themselves to be people who have no respect for diversity and frankly who historically have shown themselves to be capable of another Holocaust. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Karl Makia. Thank you, Father Drani. Whenever I think of the word Holocaust, two uh, apparently contradictory things come to my mind. First is the complete and utter uniqueness of what was done to European Jewry from the 1930s through 1945. And the second is the ease with which our species can seemingly replicate similarly unfathomable and radically evil acts uh, that often compel us to think of ourselves as monsters of one kind or another. It, it, it seems to me that probably one of the most important lessons of the Holocaust for all human beings today is to accept the way in which both of these meanings are actually accommodated and find a place for themselves in the word Holocaust. The reasons why people set about to routinely kill one another in a methodical and highly organized way, whether we are talking about one million Armenians, six million Jews, or a couple of hundred thousand Kurds in northern Iraq, are almost always very, very different from one another. There is no common ground, I, I believe, to be found in those reasons, that rationale for the killing, that often bureaucratic rationale. Also, the ways in which people are killed or tortured are invariably very different in one case from the other. Certainly, they share many common features, but always in the end, they are experienced as though they were happening for the first time. And that is why no two survivors from the Holocaust, from any act of genocide or collective murder of this scale, no two survivors ever tell the same story. Cruelty is, in this sense, always very particular, very individual. And in order for us, to whom such terrible things have not personally 
impinged upon our bodies in order for us to understand this kind of cruelty. It seems to me that we have to let that individuality, that personality of each story speak to us. And that is why the stories of survivors are so important to the workings of our collective memory today. Like all stories, they need to be told and retold. And in this telling and retelling, no doubt the stories change. They change because our understanding changes. And the idea of absolute truth uh, in these kinds of matters is always very, very complicated. Why did it happen? How could it have happened? We ask of things like the Holocaust, of the, of the mass murder that is going on today in Bosnia, of what happened to the Iraqi Kurds in northern Iraq in 1988. And we never ever really get to the absolute certainty in answering that question. Because there is always something unknowable, something that is impossible to put in words about cruelty on this kind of a scale. The emotional essence of cruelty is, I would suggest, in the end, even beyond words. It is impossible to put your finger down, I know what it is, this, and state it. If it is impossible to put in words, it's by people, for instance, like myself, who have not experienced it personally, to whom it has not happened. We need the tangible and human evidence which stories uh, and artifacts uh, provide us with. I just brought along one such artifact related to the mass campaign of extermination of Iraqi Kurds that shows you, hopefully, what I mean by this palpable, tangible nature of cruelty. This is book is taken from the records of the Iraqi secret police during the uprising that happened in Iraq in March 1991. It's, it, the, it says in Arabic here, a list of eliminated villages. And there are here in handwriting by some minor bureaucrat in a small town in northern Iraq, a list of villages that have been eliminated. Map references, details of names, governor that it belongs to, and so on, and exact date which the village was eliminated. By eliminated, that means erased completely with bulldovers, concreted up wells, and raised cemeteries. Something like 3,500 such villages have been eliminated in northern Iraq in the last 10 to 12 years. The Holocaust and gross cruelty of the kind that I'm talking about that is present in this simple little school book with its flowers and its carnations, its list of villages written by some simple bureaucrat with a family who goes home to his kids after, after he's finished entering his daily toll, that kind of cruelty should never be confused with mere violence. These two things are very different. They overlap, that is for sure. But they are not the same. Violence can be justified according to the ends that it pursues, for instance, in self-defense. There can be violence between equals. Cruelty, on the other hand, can never be justified because it is the intentional infliction of pain on individuals who are always necessarily in a position of weakness to the one who is doing the inflicting. For there to be cruelty, therefore, there has to be subjugation and powerlessness in some form. The violation of the body, the human body of someone in a position of weakness, by force or with an instrument of some kind, has this visceral, irrational, irrevocable quality about it. And this, these qualities, these impossible to put into words qualities of cruelty is the bedrock, I believe, under which, which lies at the bottom of all the other terrible things that we human beings are capable of doing to one another. Now, if one thinks of the Holocaust as the epitome of the most extreme kind of cruelty that I'm talking about as an event, it's also very important to constantly recall its modernity as an event. Killing by bureaucratic edict, routinely administered as in this book, often with clinical efficiency, is not the same as killing out of vengeance 
or as a result of the eruption of old animosities and ancient hatreds, which supposedly go back centuries, and which I believe opinion makers are making far too much of these days. Because the kind of killing that we are talking about when we talk about the Holocaust, when we talk about what's happening, what happened in northern Iraq in this booklet, and I believe even what we're talking about in, in, in Bosnia, that is a very modern phenomenon. Consider, for instance, the story of the Syrian massacre in Hama, in which something like 40,000 people may have been killed in a few weeks, or were killed in a few weeks in 1982. The Syrian army had encircled the town, supposedly to crush what they termed an Islamic rebellion. The rebels and ordinary citizens flooded into the old quarter known as the Keilaniya district of Hama. This was an extraordinarily beautiful part of the old city with catacombs and twisted alleyways, a kind of casbah of the Eastern Mediterranean. There, the people hid. The army surrounded them and pounded the area with artillery until it all turned to rubble. A Syrian friend of mine who, from Hama, fled all of this destruction, and he stayed abroad. 10 years on, he plucked up the courage to return to his hometown. He went to visit the quarter of Keilaniya, where he was brought up as a child. He looked at what he thought was his neighborhood from the other side of the river. At first, he thought he was in the wrong place. The sight that confronted him was both familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. He shut his eyes and tried to recall the scene, to remember it in his mind's eye, the way he knew it was supposed to look. Then he opened his eyes again and looked again. Yes, no doubt about it. He was looking at the old neighborhood of Keilaniya, his old neighborhood. But instead of all the beautiful old houses with their twisted alleyways and underground pathways going back centuries, there was a bald hill, a modern Syrian urban park. And rising up out of the middle of this hill, which entombed maybe up to 40,000 human beings, many of whom he might have known in happier days, my friend saw a brand new, shining, 11-story Meridian Hotel. I think of this hotel as a metaphor for what modern states can do and how they can wage an assault not only on people's lives, those people buried under it and in its foundations, but on our memories and on our most basic notions of who we are. What is going on in a story like this? It was not always like this in the Arab world. It was not always like this, as I'm sure a friend, the ambassador has said in former Yugoslavia, in Bosnia. It was certainly not always like this. And there are many, many factors involved in each case which explain maybe partially why things turned out the way they did. I don't have the time to go into those things now. But I want to ask a question. Have we, intellectuals, Arab in my case, or third world intellectuals in general, confronted this rising curve of cruelty in the world in anything like the way in which, for instance, our counterparts in Europe did in an earlier period? Have we responded to our own drive towards self-destruction with anything like the thoughts of Voltaire in the 17th century when he said, quote, we are all products of frailty, fallible and prone to error. So let us mutually pardon each other's follies this is the first principle of human rights. Voltaire's words ought to impress themselves upon us at the moments of our greatest self-destructiveness as a species. It is not for nothing, I believe, that he wrote them as a reaction to the 17th century, one of the cruelest centuries in European history, century of religious wars in Europe itself. An intelligentsia internalizes the state of its world, whether explicitly or subliminally its language invariably being shaped by it, either through acknowledgement or through denial. Decreasing revulsion at cruelty is, in the long run, as dangerous as cruelty itself. If the dominant Arab intellectual currents had had their way in 1990-91, during the Gulf crisis, the Arab world would today almost certainly be faced with a much stronger Saddam Hussein, 
who, having digested Kuwait, would be preparing to attack another Arab country right now, as we speak. Why is it that then, that during the Gulf crisis, hardly any Arab intellectuals inquired into the consequence for other Arabs of the Iraqi bath getting away with Kuwait? The nightmarish cruel cruelties that became the norm inside Iraq that I've shown you in this book would have been exported yet again. How many more people would have been occupied, tortured, killed, gassed, and humiliated? And why is there not one good book in Arabic on the Lebanese Civil War, and not one book on Hama written by, uh, and only one book on Hama written by the Muslim Brotherhood, which no one pays uh, attention to because of its authorship? Instead of recognizing our fallibility and frailty, often we of the third world and Arabs, I might add, and it saddens me very much to say, we have been perfecting in the last quarter of a century a different kind of language than Voltaire. One that is constantly preoccupied with blaming others, in particular blaming the West, for instance, or maybe Israel for problems that are largely, though not completely, of our own making. Scapegoating the West and disregarding cruelty are in this regard two aspects of the same language of denial and unwillingness to face up to the consequences of one's own world. The language of denial and of blaming everyone other than oneself for one's tragic plight has intersected in a doubly tragic way with rising cruelty in the Middle East. As in Europe during the 17th century, when cruelty and fanaticism, religious fanaticism, were rampant, everyone in the Middle East today feels threatened. Shiites in Iraq, Sunnis in Syria, Kurds everywhere, Israelis, Palestinians under Israeli occupation, and all over the diaspora, Palestinian diaspora. The list is endless. When one feels threatened, Regardless of whether or not the perceived threat is real, I emphasize that, regardless of the reality of the threat, one has the choice of responding in two ways. Either of reaching out in a spirit of reconciliation, as Voltaire and others, of course, did, or turning inwards in a spirit of bitterness and recrimination. Unfortunately, the Middle East today is a world in which everybody is a victim. But more importantly, most people think like victims. If you attack someone for being him or herself, the natural response is to assert that one is the very thing that one is attacked for being. I'm running out of time, so I'll try to wrap up. Nothing, I believe, helps to create new instances of cruelty than the collective accumulation of that kind of feeling, where loss of empathy for the other becomes the norm. Now, I brought all this up because I want to end on what seems to me to be the only way in which we can protect ourselves, however uh, in a fragile way, from the apparent ease with which we replicate things, events like the Holocaust. And I, that way is truth-telling, telling the story of what happened through the survivors. In his last meditation, just before taking his own life, Primo Levi wrote of the survivors of the Holocaust this comment, quote, almost all the survivors, orally or in their written memoirs, remember a dream which frequently recurred during the nights of imprisonment, varied in its detail but always uniform in its substance. The dream was they had returned home and with passion and relief were describing their past sufferings, addressing themselves to a loved one, and were not believed, indeed were not even listened to. In the most typical and cruelest form, the interlocutor turned and left in silence. I was told by a little Kurdish boy of 12 years old, virtually the same, who doesn't speak, read or write, a version of that dream as well, which I don't have time now to read for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Helen Fine. Uh, genocide persists because it succeeds. It succeeds in doing away with groups which considered threats to a ruling 
group. We have three things we can do to save them. One, to save the victims, to defend them, intervene or escape, help them escape. Uh, we can also delegitimate the perpetrators. I'm told it's time to say thank you. Let me, let me echo the thanks to the Ford Hall Forum. It's in its 85th fifth year, and I said to the officials here that I'd urge a second collection for the uh, right now, after all, it's Holy Week. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr said once that the persistence of anti-Semitism is unique. Other prejudices are uh, localized or transitional, but anti-Semitism, Reinhold Niebuhr, the great Protestant theologian, said, has a historical permanence and a geopolitical perversity, and we remember that tonight, and remember also that we in America, if you will, are dreamers. We have had our share of persecution and animosity towards races, but that we boldly proclaim tonight that we love our neighbors, we're very sorry about what's happening. I, for one, with all Americans, lament the fact that we don't seem to know what to do or we are unable to, do, uh, to know, and that Judaism and Christianity uh, both say that God has intervened in history. He has revealed himself in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that we in that spirit in this week come together lamenting all our omissions, and that God has told us to help and love our neighbor, to be sensitive to the less fortunate, and the date is most appropriate, as I said, after the uh, New Year and before uh, Good Friday, we join the Jewish community around the world and all of those who are being persecuted and the Bosnians. And let us say in conclusion here a prayer from the Jewish liturgy which is most appropriate. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to kindle the light of the day of remembrance to which we say amen. Thank you and good night.